be live. Yes, so yes, we, we are live. We are live. <coughs> okay. Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to the Srimad Bhagavatam class of ISKCON Portland on Sundays. Hare Krishna, Jai Nitai Prabhu, Narottam Vilas Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. So, we will uh, start with Mangalacharan prayers and then we will recite the invocation verses and then we can uh, start with the verse for today. So, I will share my screen. So I hope my internet uh, remains stable. So, so far, it's really good to And um, yeah. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Soyam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Swa Padantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha <coughs> Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Preshtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namini Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine he Krishna Karuna Sindho Dinabandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostuti Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakal Patarubhyascha Kripa Sindho Bhyayevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Krishna Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Jagat Guru Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Granth Raj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Ek long the no? Okay, so we will recite the invocation verses of Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaiva Narottamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tato Jayamudirayet Nashta Prayeshu Abhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Yuttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki Krishnaya Vasudevaya Devaki Nandanayacha Nanda Gopakumaraya Govindaya Namonamaha Okay. So today's verse is Srimad Bhagavatam, 
Canto 1, Chapter 13, Verse number 55. So I will share the screen and we can recite the verse. Okay, so I will recite a few times and then I will request devotees if they want to recite, then we can do that. Vigyanatmani Sanyojya Kshetra Ge Pravilapyatam Brahmanyatmanam Adhare Ghatambaram Ivambare. One more time. Vigyanatmani Sanyojya Kshetra Ge Pravilapyatam Brahmanyatmanam Adhare Ghatambaram Ivambare Vigyanatmani Sanyojya Kshetra Ge Pravilapyatam Brahmanyatmanam Adhare Ghatambaram Ivambare. Would some devotees like to recite? If I can try to go. Bignanat money, some yoja, Shetrakni, Pravila, Pitam, Brahmanyat Manamadhare, Katam, Baram Ivambare. Thank you, Krishna. Very nice. Thank you. Very oh. good, Ruji. Vigyanatmani Sanyojya Kshetagya Pravilapyatam Brahmani Atmana Atmanam Adhare Ghatambaram Ivambare. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Jainitai Prabhu. Anyone else? All right. So we will move forward. <clears throat> with synonyms Vigyana purified identity Atmani in intelligence Samyojya perfectly fixing Kshetragye in the matter of the living being Pravilapya <clears throat> merging Tam him Brahmani in the supreme Atmanam, pure living being. <coughs> Adhare, in the reservoir. Ghata Ambaram, sky within the block. Iva, like Ambare, in the supreme sky. Translation. Dhritarashtra will have to amalgamate his pure identity with intelligence and then merge into the supreme being with knowledge of his qualitative oneness as a living entity with the supreme Brahman. Being freed from the blocked sky, he will have to rise to the spiritual sky. Very nice translation by Srila Prabhupada actually. I will explain why I say that later. Purport by His Divine Grace, Abhay Charna Arvind, Bhaktivedanta, Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada ki chai. <clears throat> the living being, by his desiring to lord it over the material world and declining to cooperate with the Supreme Lord, contacts the sum total of the material world, namely the Mahat Tattva, and from the Mahat Tattva, his false identity with the material world, intelligence, mind and senses is developed. This covers his pure spiritual identity. By the yogic process, when his pure identity is realized in self-realization, one has to revert to the original position by 
amalgamating the five gross elements and the subtle elements, mind and intelligence into the Mahat Tattva again. Into a week? Okay. Welcome, Vidak Madhav Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thus, Hare Krishna. Thus, getting freed from the clutches of the Mahat Tattva, he has to merge in the existence of the Super Soul. In other words, he has to realize that qualitatively he is non-different from the Super Soul. And thus he transcends the material sky by his pure identical intelligence and thus becomes engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. This is the highest perfectional development of spiritual identity, which was attained by Dhritarashtra by the grace of Vidura and the Lord. The Lord's mercy was bestowed upon him by his personal contact with Vidura and when he was actually practicing the instructions of Vidura, the Lord helped him to attain the highest perfectional stage. A pure devotee of the Lord does not live on any planet of the material sky nor does he feel any contact with material elements. His so-called material body does not exist. Being surcharged with the spiritual current of the Lord's identical interest. And thus he is permanently freed from all contaminations of the sum total of the Mahat Tattva. <clears throat> he is always in the spiritual sky, which he attains by being transcendental to the sevenfold material coverings by the effect of his devotional service. <clears throat> The conditioned souls are within the coverings, whereas the liberated soul is far beyond the cover. So, Srila Prabhupada has basically covered all the points that I read from previous Acharya's commentaries. Very, very wonderful. And this is so wonderful. Today we have English translations of all the previous Acharya's commentaries or in some cases, Hindi translations at least. Srila Prabhupada, when he was writing these purports, he had probably, he didn't have any of those. And probably he did not, may not have had access to all the commentaries in printed form either. Maybe he did. But his purport covers the essence, or not even the essence, pretty much all the points from all previous Acharya's commentaries. I wonder how he did that. So, yeah, that's the, you know, genius and expertise of Srila Prabhupada. So, I will share more from what I read from the other Acharya's commentaries, but some points to be covered from Srila Prabhupada's purport, and then we'll unpack the verse a little bit. So one of the things that is being described in this verse, uh, well, yeah, let's, I just wanted to cover the background first. So the background of this discussion, this seems uh, at least to be a heavy verse. The translation is Dhritarashtra will have a lot of big words are being used and I had to read it a few times to understand it. Dhritarashtra will have to amalgamate his pure identity with, the, with intelligence and then merge into the supreme being with knowledge of his qualitative oneness as a living entity with the supreme Brahman. Being freed from the blocked sky, he will have to rise to the spiritual sky. It's kind of like a philosophically heavy verse. Um... And where or why this verse is occurring, I like to cover the background for somebody who may not have followed the weekly 
classes or the sequence of the chapter, Yudhishthir discovered that um, Dhritarashtra and Gandhari and as well as Vidurji, who had returned from pilgrimage, mainly to meet his brother Dhritarashtra, they were all missing. And he was very disturbed and very concerned about them. And he was very anxious and uh, lamenting, where have they gone? So, as you know, Vidur chastised uh, Dhritarashtra very strongly and said that you are wasting your life. You have lived the life of a total materialist and now you should go and make spiritual progress. So ultimately, Dhritarashtra, you know, realizes that what his brother is telling is actually in his benefit. So he leaves with his brother and his wife. So this makes, and then, and without telling anyone in the middle of the night. So on in the morning when Yudhishthir discovers that they are missing, he is very anxious and very distressed. And to pacify him, Narad Muni appears and he pacifies him. And he says a couple of very important things. One thing that he says, which is covered in the several verses before, is that, you know, why are you lamenting? So, you know, he says for, his, for their concern, for their well-being. So, Narad Muni says that we think we are the protectors of others. Other people will not be able to protect themselves. They depend on us. And that is such a foolish thought that we have. And Narad Muni in very um, strong or very intense terms describes that we, we think we are indispensable. Uh, we are uh, we other people depend on us for protection and so on but we cannot even protect ourselves what to speak of protecting someone else kala or time is waiting to eat us just like one creature eats the other one day we will be eaten ourselves so how can we protect anyone and we think we are other people's protectors. So it's a very, very deep point. At least I found it to be very true. And I, you know, as you know, my children live outside, you know, in a different city and I worry about them. And I, you know, worry about some of my close friends and others, you know, how they are doing. So it was a very hard hitting verse or set of verses and so true that we cannot even protect ourselves. What to speak of protecting others and that the Supreme Lord is the only protector and he is protecting your aunt and uncle. So don't worry. So that was one point. The second point is that wherever your uncle and aunt have gone, is a place where there is shelter of the sages available. So they will be protected or they are under the blessings of the sages and the devotees. And also he knew that one great devotee is traveling along with them, which is Vidura. So uh, Narad Muni also tells that Vidura is guiding your uncle and he is performing intense yoga and he will reach or attain the perfected position within the next five days. So very specific things Narad Muni tells to Yudhishthir Maharaj, which pacifies Yudhishthir Maharaj quite a bit. So this verse is one of the verses in that section where Narad Muni is telling Yudhishthir 
how Dhritarashtra is performing uh, intense yogic practices to perfect himself. And so once again, let me share the screen. So with that background, uh, you will see here, again, the translation is given here. that Dhritarashtra will have to amalgamate his pure, pure identity with the intelligence and then merge into the supreme being with knowledge of his qualitative oneness as the living entity with the supreme Brahman. Being freed from the blocked sky, he will have to rise to the spiritual sky. So what is mentioned here is that how one, um, the process of merging of the body into the Supreme Lord, into the Brahman, and how the Brahman merges into the Supreme Lord is described in this verse. So Srila Prabhupada is saying that is actually how the material body is comes into existence. The from Mahat Tattva and then from Mahat Tattva, the false identity is created, the intelligence, mind, and senses are developed. And then this covers the spiritual identity. And then one gets the material identity and the material body. Now what is being described here is that by the yogic process, one has to reverse this entire process. So that reversal process, how to go from material body to merging into the Supreme Lord is being described in this verse. <clears throat> so Srila Prabhupada has not gone into all the details, but here I wanted to mention that he has mentioned the essence that that is how the material body forms and it needs, that process needs to be reversed in order to um, be liberated. So other previous acharyas, primarily Sri Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, uh, has explained that very nicely and I wanted to cover that in detail a little bit or step by step. So what is explained here, you can see from the verse that um, the gross body, which is the elements of the body are uh, they merge. So the gross body comes into existence from the subtle body and the root or the main cause of the subtle of the gross body is ahankar or false ego. So that false ego is called here as atmanam. And in the reversal process, the gross body merges into the subtle body or the main cause of the subtle body, which is ahankar. There are two words here which describe the word merge. Samyojya and pravilapya. So, you can see here that what is being said is that the gross body merges into the atmanam or the false ego. Then the Atmanam merges into the Vigyanatmani. Vigyanatmani is the Mahat Tattva. So the Atmanam merges into the Vigyanatmani, into the Mahat Tattva. Mahat Tattva merges into the Kshetragya. Who is the Kshetragya from Bhagavad Gita? Who can tell? Chapter 13. Hmm? Body, Prabhu. Kshetragya is body. No. The, 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 the living entity, Prabhu, and also the Lord. Both. Yes, Kshetragya has two meanings. The living entity and the supreme living entity or the Paramatma and the living entity, the Jivatma. So here, 
Kshetragya, the body Vidak Mahatma Prabhu is Kshetra. So I think you got mixed those yeah. two terms. Kshetra is the body. The knower of the body is Kshetra Gya. Gya means one who knows, who has the Gyan of the Kshetra. And that is the living entity who knows his body. And there is the main Kshetra Gya or the Supreme Lord who knows all bodies, all living entities, all the bodies. So there are two Kshetra Gyas anyway. So here in this word, in this work, Kshetragya refers to the living entity. So, where we are, Mahat Tattva merges into the Jivatma or the Jiva, which is referred to as Kshetragya. Then, Kshetragya merges into Brahmani. Brahmani is the Paramatma. And finally, the Paramatma merges into Aadhar. Aadhar means the basis or the foundation. And the supreme foundation of everything is the Supreme Lord. So here Srila Prabhupada has said in the reservoir, but previous Acharyas say that Aadhar here is referring to the Supreme Lord. So the supreme reservoir or the main reservoir is the Supreme Lord. So in that sense, it is correct. So, Aadhar is the Supreme Lord. So, the Paramatma merges into the Supreme Lord. So, what is the sequence? The gross body merges into the subtle body or Ahankar, which is the main cause of the subtle body. So, that is uh, Atmanam. And then the subtle body merges into the Mahatattva, which is Vigyana Atmani. That merges, the Mahatattva merges into the Jiva, which is the Kshetragya. The Jiva merges into the Paramatma, which is Brahmani. And the Paramatma merges into the Supreme Lord, Bhagwan, which is Adhar. So all these words are there in this verse. And then there are two words that are remaining, Samyojya and Pravilapya, Pravilapya, which is merging. So you and we understand these three lines. Vigyanatmani, Samyojya, Kshetragya, Pravilapyatam, Brahmani, Atmanam, Adhare. Now, fourth line is there, Ghatambaram, Ivambare. So what is Ambar? Ambar means sky. So a very nice example is given on the merging process. Merging process is very interesting. It's not like uh, how, how can the living entity or merge into the Paramatma or Paramatma merge into Bhagavan. So, first of all, Paramatma and Bhagavan are the same or are they? Or what is the difference? Why is it mentioned that Paramatma merges into Bhagavan? What is the there is small discussion we can have on that? So, any thoughts why? It is mentioned that, or when does Paramatma merge into Bhagavan? So, any but as yeah. annihilation of the manifested material world. Yes, Prabhuji, very nice. At the time of the annihilation of the material universe. So, what what is Paramatma? Paramatma are is considered in three aspects. The three Purusha avatars, the Karano Dakshai Vishnu, Garbo Dakshai Vishnu and Kshiro Dakshai Vishnu are the Paramatmas in this and their function in this material universe and their function is to oversee Upadrishta and Anumanta permitter in this material universe. 13.23 of Bhagavad Gita. 
So Upadrishta and Anumanta, they perform the functions of monitoring or overseeing and permitter or grant grants the desires of the living entities. So uh, when the annihilation occurs, then the Paramatma merges into the Supreme Lord. So therefore, there is a difference between the Paramatma and the Supreme Lord in this sense, as far as their function is concerned, because at the time of annihilation, Paramatma has no function. So therefore, Paramatma merges into the Supreme Lord. So it is because of the function that Paramatma exists. So, um, when Jiva merges into the Paramatma or Paramatma merges into Bhagwan, this last line, I'm probably not sharing. Let me share again. This last line is a very nice example. Ghatambaram Ivambare. So, Ambar means sky. And you can see here that Ambar word is coming two times. Ghata Ambaram, Ghata Ambaram, Ghata Ambara and Iva Ambare. So, Ghata means, Srila Prabhupada has said, sky within the block. But in Sanskrit, the word Ghata means what? Ghat means a pot, a ghada. Hindi mein kehte hain ghada, ghata. A pot. So, when there is a pot, there is empty pot. There is no water or halwa in the pot. So, empty pot. <laughs> But there is sky in the pot, correct? So there is a difference between the sky inside the pot and sky outside the pot, ambara. So ghatambaram is the sky inside the pot. And there is sky outside the pot, which is called here as ambara. But when that material covering of the ghata of the pot is broken, so suppose you break the pot, then what happens to the sky inside the pot? It merges with the sky outside the pot, isn't it? So what is the difference between the two skies? So they are the same. And then you cannot make out, once you have broken the pot, can you make out this was the sky which was within the pot or this was the sky which was outside the pot? And here we are talking about sky as in space. We are not talking about air molecules or, you know, things like that. You can say, oh, this molecule was inside and now it is outside or whatever. So we are talking about just space, empty space. Imagine a pot in empty space outside the atmosphere. So <clears throat> there are no molecules or atoms. So when you break the, if you break the pot, then that merging occurs. So, what is the difference? The difference is only in the quantity or the limitedness. When there is the pot, the sky inside the pot is limited and the sky outside is unlimited. So, there is difference in quantity and Srila Prabhupada has mentioned this in the purport somewhere that qualitatively, yeah, here. In other words, at the time of self-realization, he realizes that qualitatively he is non-different from the super soul. So when the jiva merges into the <coughs> paramatma, qualitatively it means that one realizes that qualitatively there is no difference. Quantitatively, there is a difference. So, uh, this is the Philosophy in this one word, ghatam baram ivam bare, the philosophy of achintya, bheda abheda, or at least bheda abheda, whether it is achintya or not is not covered in this verse. Achintya means inconceivable, but at least bheda abheda, oneness and difference has been brought out. Just like the sky is one inside and outside the pot, yet it is different. As long as the, the pot exists. <coughs> so as long as there is a material covering. Oh. 
So as long as there's material covering, there is quantitative difference, but qualitative oneness. And after self-realization, they become, there is no difference. And then the Paramatma, similarly, at the end of annihilation or at the time of annihilation, merges into the Supreme Lord. So these are the points. Uh, these are some of the points that previous Acharyas have brought out about this verse. So another point that is brought out is that this verse is describing that Dhritarashtra is performing this intense process of yoga. And this is because he is not yet purified. So this is the process of purification that is occurring. And this process is mainly internal, but it manifests externally. It is internal because what it means that it is internal is because internally his gunas, what are gunas? The sattva, rajas and tamas, these are the material gunas. They are conditioned. So that means the gunas, the, the living entity is conditioned by the material gunas. And not even not 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 even conditioned, but conditioned in a bad way. So there was a lot of agitation and disturbance in within Dhritarashtra because of his past conditioning or his past samskaras. And therefore, due to this internal uh, conditioning of the by the gunas, it manifested externally in the disturbed or the agitated state of senses of Dhritarashtra. So Dhritarashtra's senses, external senses, were always disturbed. So as we see from Mahabharata, he was always uh, anxious. He was always in a conflict. He was always uh, um, disturbed and unsure of what to do. And ultimately, he um, acted in the in favor of his sense gratification and which primarily meant to you know uh, to satisfy the desires of his son so his sense gratification he aligned it with the sense gratification of his son duryodhan so this process or due to his uh, past conditioning because of that he was always disturbed and agitated and he is undergoing this yogic process of cleansing and purifying himself. And in this process, he had a great asset. And the greatest asset, there was no assets that Dhritarashtra had in his life. Because of his past karmic activity, he was born blind. So that was his greatest misfortune or one of his misfortunes. But all said and done, he had one great asset. Anybody knows what was the great asset that Dhritarashtra had? His brother was a pure devotee. Uh, yeah. It's the yes. first thing to mind. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Yes, you are right. That's That's the greatest or probably the only asset Dhritarashtra had in his life was his brother Vidura. And not only that, that Vidura was a great devotee, but he cared for Dhritarashtra. And he did not leave him till the end. In a few verses later, we will see that uh, Vidura was there 
right till the moment Dhritarashtra leaves his body. And then Vidura departs. So Vidura was alongside Dhritarashtra throughout this process. So not only was Vidura a great devotee, but Dhritarashtra had the fortune of having the compassion, the kind association, and the commitment or the committed nature of Vidura towards him. So, a devotee is always committed to another devotee's progress, at least to ones that are close or affectionate, snigdha to him. And he was guided by Vidurji throughout this process. Now, as we can see, sometimes this guidance comes in very harsh ways. First, Vidurji tried to explain before even the war, he was trying to put sense into Dhritarashtra, but was unsuccessful. But he did not give up. After the war was over, he comes back, again tries to give sense, put some sense into Dhritarashtra. And even, uh, you know, goes on to say some very harsh words to Dhritarashtra. All of these things, including the chastisement, is called mercy of the devotee. So we will see here in the purport, Srila Prabhupada stresses on this point. So where is that? Hmm. Yeah. The Lord's mercy was bestowed upon him, upon Dhritarashtra, by his personal contact with Vidura. And when he was actually practicing the instructions of Vidura, the Lord helped him to attain the highest perfectional stage. So he was following, he actually for the first time in his life began to follow the instructions of Vidura and that helped him to attain the highest stage. So this mercy of that was bestowed, Lord's mercy was bestowed through Vidura. Here also we see this is the highest perfectional development of the spiritual identity, which was attained by Dhritarashtra, by the grace or by the mercy of Vidura and the Lord. <clears throat> so the mercy of devotees is extremely, extremely important. And through Vidura's mercy, only was Dhritarashtra able to make such good, such wonderful spiritual progress. So what is the meaning of this mercy of the devotee? What does it mean? We say, you know, we are looking for mercy of devotees. So I was, uh, had the fortune of hearing some, you know, statements by some saintly, very saintly people and, uh, you know, I'm just wanted to share my, uh, my understanding of what is the meaning of this mercy. Why, why only some people get the mercy? If mercy is there, why everybody doesn't get it? We give example that mercy is flowing like the Ganga. So everybody can go and dip in the Ganga and become purified or get the mercy if it is just flowing you just have to go and uh, you know take a dip so why everybody doesn't experience that i received the mercy so what is this mercy and if it is all the mercy of somebody else of a devotee who is somebody else then why can't why do we have to do anything why can't we just sit and uh, wait and uh, till then, you know, twiddle thumbs or do nothing and wait for the mercy. So you can sit and wait. Uh, 
So what is the meaning of this mercy of a devotee? So what I understood, I'll just share my understanding and I'll, you know, devotees can add to it. So the first thing is that the mercy of the devotees is the main cause for our spiritual progress. And that is also what is said. But as I said, if that is the main cause, it leads to these contradictory questions that why only some people seem to receive mercy and make progress. If that is the main cause and somebody is making progress and somebody else or we are not, then we seem to think he has mercy, but we don't have. How does that, how do you explain that? So first thing is that mercy is truly the main cause. <laughs> And if that is the main cause, then why do we need to add anything, any other cause, like our effort? So, the second thing to realize is that our efforts are completely futile, are not able to achieve perfection, let alone perfection. We cannot even take few steps towards perfection by ourselves. Only by the Lord's mercy, which is coming through the devotees, is it possible? So, but the answer to those contradictory questions is that we must put a sincere and intense effort and attempt from our side. And it is not that on seeing our attempt, the devotee showers their mercy. Another example is given is that when the child cries, then the mother gives milk. But it is more than that. It is more like the milk is flowing. It's already there. It's not like when the child cries, then the mother comes to the child. That is also not, there is, that analogy is good for to a certain level, but it's not like when we put intense effort from our side, then the devotees begin to show mercy. Ah, this person is putting effort. Let me give my mercy to him. This other guy is not putting in so much effort. Let me not give my, let me withhold my mercy from this guy. That is not the case either. It's a more magical process that when we put a sincere and intense effort then we realize that we have made no progress out of our effort. So when we put sincere, sincere means for the right reason, not just for the sake of it or mechanically because somebody else said or anything like that. When there is internal conviction that I want to make spiritual progress, I really want to make spiritual progress and I this is the process of making progress, then I put sincere effort in that progress, in that process, because I'm convinced that I want that goal. So that has to happen first anyway. And then one is putting the effort and the needle is not moving at all. And when one sees that the needle is not moving at all and time is flying by, weeks, convert into months, months convert into years and we see that no progress is made and we get to a stage of desperation as to why we are not making any spiritual progress in spite of putting sincere and intense efforts. Then something happens and this is the magical portion our hearts open up. The doors of our heart open and then the mercy which is already flowing is already there outside enters the heart. So the mercy is already there outside but our hearts are closed because we think we can do it. And it's not a theoretical thing that to realize that we cannot. It has to be practically realized by putting intense effort 
and coming to that stage of desperation or in Sanskrit it is called Vyakulta that I am not making any progress and then out of that desperation instead of giving up we cry out that my efforts are so uh, futile or so um, are not producing are not are not producing the result that that we are so eagerly desirous of and these are it's not like any fruitive results these are spiritual results love for krishna the desire to serve shri krishna the desire for krishna prem so and then when we cry out or something magical happens our hearts open up and the mercy which is already present enters So when we realize that there is no hope left, when we have tried every possibility, we have tried, knocked on all doors, nothing has worked, then the heart opens really and the mercy at that point enters. So <clears throat> this is my understanding by listening to some very saintly people. And uh, I wanted to share that that is probably the state of Dhritarashtra. And he had this association of this wonderful, wonderful devotee, Vidurji. So another thing is that we must strive to develop very strong devotee association. Associating with devotees who are themselves very sincere in making progress they do not have to be if one can get the association of a pure devotee like in jaiva dharma there is you know who is that uh, what is the name of that devotee whose association this vrajnath gets i forget of all of you are... or there is paramahamsa babaji and there is raghunath das babaji yes yes so Thank you. So, you know, that will be best. But even if we don't have that, then at least getting the association of devotees who are sincerely making an attempt, who are very sincere and <clears throat> serious about making progress and are putting in intense effort themselves is extremely, extremely important. So, and in a the more the more we associate, the more we ourselves put a sincere attempt, the more that mood of desperation and therefore surrender will occur. And we will realize that that is our only hope, the mercy of the devotees, and then the mercy enters the heart and then we have the hope of making some progress so that is my understanding and that is what i think was the ultimate uh, factor in dhritarashtra's success so uh, we are at the top of the hour i will stop here and see if devotees want to add anything or correct me for anything wrong I said or have any comments, questions, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhuji. Appreciate the class and the realization. Uh, I wanted to uh, share one, one thing, if you permit me. Um, uh, I one time heard from Jamuna Devi. She uh, gave uh, an example of what Srila Prabhupada had, had said about the mercy of Guru, how it's always flowing. And he, the analogy he gave was uh, 
the that we're when we're in a cave we can't um we can't experience the sunlight but when we step out of the cave the even though the sunlight's always shine always shining you know it's full day outside midday we're in the cave we can't experience the sun but when we come out we can experience and benefit from the sun so in, in the same way the that that um that's when we uh receive guru's mercy when we step out of the cave and not the same same idea that you were saying just uh different analogy to you so thank very you. nice thank, thank, you. thank you thank you probably taking the time to uh prepare this and share your realizations with us I always appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If nobody else uh, has anything Thank else. You, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for a wonderful class, Prabhu, as always. This is very insightful. And then it will speak from the heart, Prabhu. And thank you for explaining uh, the words so beautifully, especially the last part where you shared your realization, or what, that is what you heard from uh, the senior Vaishnavas. That is very, very beautiful. You know, uh, you could say very magical. It's, you know, and I, I think it, it, it make me a little bit more appreciative or, uh, desire of desirous of, maintaining and creating, um, uh, association of devotees, especially those who are very eager, to progress themselves, not at all out of you know, I mean sincere desire, not just out of vanity or, to show how wonderful they are, but sincere desire uh since with sincerity to sort of make better uh, make progress and attain the highest good that thank you so much for that is very beautiful Prabhu. very beautiful thank you so much thank you thank you Prabhuji. okay okay then if you all permit we can end the class here Okay, I'll leave it to you, Narottam Milas Prabhu. Yeah, thank you so much once again, Prabhu, for taking your time and giving us your valuable association and my seven Shrimad Bhagavatam and you know, helping us get inch closer to achieve the supreme goal of Lat Krishna Prem. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for taking you know, speak all the way from Bangalore. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Thank you wonderful Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.